the second panel, before we head to lunch and then our keynote speaker, the second panel is called Garden to Farm to School. Now, we've all heard about farm to school programs, and we certainly want to do more of that here in Montgomery County. Um, but we also decided with panel, this panel to start with gardens. And you'll excuse me if I begin to sound a little evangelical on this issue, but that's because I am. Um, the reality is, and, and you know, at the best, hour, uh, best hours of my week, every week, are the ones that I spend in my garden, after the ones I spend with my wife, of course. But the ones that I spend in my garden are the best. And kids love it too, and the more important thing is, is that when kids participate in growing food, it is overwhelmingly, hands down, the best way to get those kids to try vegetables and fruits, that they participate in growing. And when they grow it and they try it, overwhelmingly they like it. Talk to any teacher who's done this, look at any study, and that's what you will see. So for us, even though school gardens is not, in fact, a part of the food and nutrition services per se, which I'm sure Marla is thrilled that that's not a you know, responsibility of hers, it is a critical part to getting kids anywhere, and certainly here in Montgomery County, to start eating more fruits and vegetables. And that's why we want to include the issue of gardens in this panel. So our first speaker, Carla Craddeville, um, I heard of first when I was looking at a notice online where it talked about the school garden that she was running during the summer. <gasps> because if you ever work with school gardens, the first thing you hear from administrators or school officials is like, well, of course, we, it's hard to do it because you just can't do it during the, school, the, during the summer. Well, in fact, you can. So in any event, I'm um, here to talk a little bit about what she does. Carla Craddeville is the vice president of the PTA at Flower Hill Elementary School and also the coordinator of their school garden. Please give a warm welcome to Carla Craddeville. Good morning. Um, Gordon asked me to come and talk a little bit about my garden. Uh, Flower Hill Elementary is in Gaithersburg, and um, I'm always happy to talk about my garden and my kids. <laughs> um, in our case, the garden at our school was started really because we had the money for it. Um, several years before it became part of the PTA board at our school, um, one of our previous PTA presidents had received a grant to start a garden. And for many various reasons, the garden never happened. Um, so when we were told that we had money to do something in our school courtyard, um, I was all over it. Get, my, get a chance to get my hands dirty and start something really great at our school. Let's see if I can figure out my slides. Um, we, when I first started, I was a little bit of a maze to figure out how and where I can get permission, who did I need to ask, who and where could we you know, get all the answers to get started. Um, luckily now, their MCPS has a wonderful website through the Outdoor Environmental Education Program. Um, they have a section specifically about starting school gardens, um, talks about easy steps to creating your garden, they talk, show you all of the forms that you need to fill out with facilities management in order to get permission to do so at your school and they give you all kinds of recommendations on garden planning and plants that you can use. It's a great, great place to start. Um, just talk really briefly about funding. Our grant came from the, Low, the Lowe's Toolbox for Education. Um, also, the Whole Kids Foundation, which is here today, gives out money for school gardens, the National Garden Association, and many more. Really, you just need to Google it. Um, there are lots of great organizations that are wanting to give money for school gardens these days. So planning your garden, I just want to talk a minute and put up my lovely diagram that I did for my garden, just to show you that you don't have to be a professional by any means to plan your garden. Um, the courtyard at our school is enclosed on four sides, and this was my very um, rudimentary garden plan. <laughs> The things that I would suggest that you think about first with your garden is to think about your sunshine needs. Um, what are you growing? Where do you have buildings shading, trees shading? Um, do you have the sunny space that you need to do vegetables if that's what you'd like? Um, also, where is your water going to come from? How close will you be to a good water source for your garden? And 
we didn't have this issue because we are in a courtyard, but thinking about fencing, it can be um, a big part of your budget if that's what you need. So you need to think about what kind of you know, deer, rabbits, and what other things that love to come in and eat your garden. Think about your fencing. And finally, just think about where you'd like to start your garden and where you'd like to see it go in the next few years. Perhaps you just start with a few salad tables, get the enthusiasm going for growing food at your school, and then down the road can in, you know, increase the size of your garden. Um, just a couple things about budget. Um, think about what you need to build your garden. Lumber, dirt, compost, we built raised beds in our garden, um, and we were able to bring in our own dirt to make sure that we had the right um, beginning for our plants with good soil. Um, what do you need to maintain the garden throughout the school year? Gardening tools, hoses, etc. And what do you need to keep operating in the future? Don't blow all your budget, just getting it started. Um, so that in future years, when you have to buy plants, replace plants, mulch, etc., you'll have the budget to do it. These are my friends. These are the PTA parents at my school that volunteered their time to get started. And as you go to your school, um, talk to everybody. Talk to all your parents. Talk to all your staff members. Um, when something good is happening, people want to be a part of it. Um, we started a committee at our school. It comprised of teachers and parents that helped with a lot of the red tape um, as far as spending money um, through the MP MCPS system. Um, often we had to have MCPS staff members sign off on our checks. So um, teachers and staff involve everyone. Building our garden. Um, I just wanted to talk for one moment. When we were building our garden, often with our parent volunteers, we need to come in on a weekend in order to get the most amount of people to come and help. Um, those of us that work with the school system knows that the county rents out school spaces after school hours and on the weekends. Um, this was something that we didn't know coming in and um, it can be a budget buster. <laughs> coming in on a Saturday, we had to rent our courtyard space in order to have access to the school. So I hope that as gardens become more prevalent, we can work with policymakers to sort of manage and share those costs so that volunteer groups like ours um, can you know, come into the schools and do our work without having um, that burden of paying for the space to come and volunteer our time. Um, here is us building our lovely raised garden beds for the vegetables. And we had parents and kids helping. We had a day where we came to bring in our dirt. Um, because it's a courtyard space, we brought our dirt in wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow. <laughs> These are our lovely um, Home Depot butterfly shaped kits that are the centerpiece of our butterfly garden. Um, there are lots of great things that can add interest to your garden. Don't forget to take advantage of recycled items. Um, we did this a lot in our garden. These are tires that were donated by the garage across the street from our community, and we spray painted them and turned them into planters. They turned out great. Um, we got planting about mid-April. And as it was our first season, we used seedlings and we planted lettuces, spinach, um, strawberries, carrots, and celery. We brought out the children from the classrooms to come out and plant all of our vegetables. These are first graders and second graders that came out. Some of our kids live in apartments, uh, townhouses, especially in our neighborhood, and this was the first chance that they really had to get into the dirt and you know, get planting. Had tons of fun. The garden is a perfect opportunity for outdoor classroom. Um, Hands-on learning can't be overemphasized. There are so many great ways a garden can tie in with the curriculum. Um, just for example, math, 
you know, we come out and measure rainfall amounts. Uh, science, certainly talking about life cycles, pollination. Um, a lot of our second grade classes um, grow butterflies and it was a wonderful opportunity for them to come out and talk about the life cycles of the butterflies. And then once they grew their butterflies and hatched in the classrooms, they came out to the garden and released them. Um, and it was just so much fun. Um, writing and reading, classes came outside and they wrote poetry about our butterflies, about the flowers, and certainly health and nutrition. Um, we talked a lot about where does our food come from, how much food do we need to grow to feed a classroom full of kids? How much food would we need to grow in our garden to feed the whole school? And these were just questions just to get the kids thinking about what it takes. We um, feel, I feel that a garden should really be cheerful and welcoming, especially at an elementary school level. And we added um, a few whimsical touches throughout our garden to just make that space fun. Um, this is our fairy house and our kindergarten kids have had lots and lots of fun um, searching for fairies in our garden ever since. Okay. Um, we invited our whole school community to come out on a weekend and be part of the garden. Um, this is our principal planting and some of our teachers and kids. Um, it's so important um, that the whole community and the parents got a chance to be a part of what we were doing and what their kids were talking about. And our little garden grew and grew. <laughs> and this is what it looked like in the summertime. And our vegetables also. And when our vegetables grew, we harvested them and I took them home and washed them and brought them back to the classrooms and the children who planted got to eat um, their salads and their strawberries. And you've never seen kids so enthusiastically eating vegetables as we did those days in early spring. <laughs> and we had lots and lots of great vegetables harvested. We kept our garden going in the summer for two reasons. First, many of our spring crops were still growing and they really needed tending to. And the second reason was just the enthusiasm of the students and the staff about the garden. Everyone asked me if we would grow vegetables and I said, as long as I had some help, yes. Um, we, the important thing about keeping the garden going in the summertime is really having committed volunteers but not as many as you might think. We had two teachers who lived in our neighborhood and three families, and we each took a day of the week and came to the garden to water and do a little weeding. And um, it worked out really well. Um, we, in the summertime, we took all of our harvest and we um, donated it to, the, to Manna at the food pantry. They take fresh vegetables there too. Um, the last bit is, to have a really good relationship with your building services. They take care of the outdoor space and indoor spaces at your school, and you wanna let them know that we're gonna to work together, that the garden is not gonna be extra work for them, that you're gonna be taking care of it. They're often there, the only people there in the summertime, so our building services manager is an integral part of our team um, helping with the garden, and we couldn't do it without her. Finally, I just wanted to say that I think that all of us here in the D.C. area know that at the national level, politics can really paralyze things. But here at the community level is really where activism can grow and flourish. And in this room, we really have a chance to introduce our children to healthy eating habits that will last them a lifetime and really connect them to where their food comes from and get a chance to raise really healthy, and smart, educated food consumers for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, two things I want to say. One, because you mentioned it, I attended one of the um, the uh, uh, school. What do they call them? Salad de salad parties. They had when they did harvest um, at one of the MCPS elementary schools uh, last year. I was amazed at how enthusiastic kids were about eating salads. 
I'd never actually seen that before. I probably had a little bit to do with the ranch dressing, but even those kids that didn't eat it, and it was like I was watching this going, this is the type of rituals we need in the schools to get kids eating more. So again, the whole garden program, anything you can do to, to get kids growing food is just absolutely tremendous. And at that point, it seems appropriate. I want to uh, acknowledge um, our presenting sponsor for the day, um, Whole Foods, uh, particularly Whole Foods Silver Spring and the Whole Foods Kids Foundation. Um, they are doing, as far as I can tell, more than anyone in Montgomery County to get supplies, resources, money, uh, knowledge to schools that want to start school gardens. And I know a couple, Emma, and you're here today. If you could please just give a big round of applause to the Whole Foods kids, because they're huge. Um, our next speaker, um, Joe Gradovel, um, and sort of, uh, sorry, that was our last speaker. I'm combining names. Joe Coots. Um, and taking it up a notch, um, Joe Coots, who is the uh, science resources and horticulture teacher at Sherwood High School, um, she manages a 3,000 square foot greenhouse at that school. And not only is growing food that kids eat there, but is actually starting a new curriculum for learning agriculture in our schools and producing kids who can then go on to become the farmers of tomorrow, which we so desperately need here in Montgomery County and around this, the country. I'm sure you've all heard the average age of farmers is approaching 60. We need new generations of kids who care about this stuff, who know about this stuff, who want to do it. And Jill Coots is one of the people producing him. Please give her a warm welcome. Well, I want to say I'm really inspired, Carla. Um, I, I'm doing those tires because they're just like incredible. <laughs> um, I teach at Sherwood High School and I'm really fortunate to have a really beautiful facility there. Uh, it's actually separate from the school building which is really awesome um, and I have and it's a commercial greenhouse um, so we have a lot of space to grow lots and lots of plants. And in fact, by the, you know, by the spring, it will be totally full of plants. And it's just amazing to just go in and just de-stress. Um, there's a head house that's a, like a lab room for kids to do all their potting, things like that. It keeps the greenhouse clean. And there's also classroom space. So it's really ideal for teaching horticulture. But the best part of my job is my students. How do we do this? There we go. Um, they use the greenhouse from August through June. I also have kids that come in in the summer and, and help me out there. Um, after school, I have a really uh, large group of students, mainly, in, mainly ESOL, which is kids learning English um, from all over the world. And they come in and they like to get their hours, their service learning hours, and so they help keep this place spotless, which is really important if you're growing plants in a greenhouse, is to have this greenhouse really, really clean, because if you do not keep it clean, you end up with all kinds of fungal and bug problems, and you won't have much food or plants growing there. Um, we grow for Department of Environmental Protection. We grow native um, plants for them to use in different rainscapes programs. Uh, I'm, Pam, I'm giving them a plug, okay. <laughs> um, we also grow edible plants, which is a real favorite of the kids. They are active participants in their community because what the kids do is they, you know, they grow plants, the plants are donated, we also do projects in the, in, around the school to help mitigate stormwater runoff. So they're really, um, it, it really gets them invested in their community. So they learn plant production right from the, you know, right from the source, right at school. Let's see, did I not put that? Okay, I think I forgot a picture, but I'll go back. <laughs> Um, so there's a new pathway in Montgomery County Public Schools, and it's the Environmental Horticulture Pathway. It's a career completer, meaning that kids take three courses 
and then they have an internship and they graduate as, you know, with, with a, they can have a certification and graduate as a certified professional horticulturist if they um, pass the Maryland state test. This is a, a, you know, these courses are all used, the indicators for MSDE, but we've written all the curriculum. And one of the things that were really important to us as curriculum writers is that we made um, it, everything we teach is environmentally friendly. And it's really important that kids start to understand how to grow nutritious uh, vegetables and what, what plants need, you know. So this is just a sample. Um, this is actually on, on the website if anyone's interested. Um, but it is a, it's a really um, exciting group of courses to teach. Um, it's problem-based learning. So they're doing engineering. I mean, if you can imagine, you're giving kids a problem. My, my foundation students, what they did was they had to create living walls. And the living wall system had to be self-watering. It couldn't make any, any mess on the floor. It had to be vertical garden. Um, and I just give them the materials. And they create these amazing things. Um, my plant production kids were looking at growing uh, growing vegetables hydroponically, so they had to create their own hydroponic system. I mean, this is like a 10 weeks of really intensive research. They have to learn the needs of plants, they learn ph uh, plant physiology and anatomy, how plants grow, and these are kids that, you know, they're used to everyone kind of, they have, okay, do this, do this, do this. Well, we sort of just, they do it and they have to figure out for themselves how, how it's very self-motivating because they need to learn this in order to be able to, to build these systems. So they're building raised beds. Um, I have raised beds right outside of the greenhouse on the brick wall and it's perfect. I've never had such an incredible place to grow plants. It, it grows throughout the winter because of the bricks. It, it's south facing. Um, so the kids, they, you know, they do their farming all year, all year long. And here's another example. This, is, this was this week. We're, we're growing a lot of um, Asian greens because a lot of my students are Asian and this is what they're used to eating. <laughs> But they're also, it's wheelchair accessible, so there's one of our, one of the beds is, you know, at, at waist high. So, you know, some of our LFI kids who are in wheelchairs can actually do this. There's some more, and some more. Um, kids are really into urban farming and so the plant production kids are building a little farm that's um, I have about a third of an acre that we're going to be growing trees and um, you know native trees and and some other other things but about a third of that is going to be for uh, food production so they've been busy building raised beds putting in the soil and uh, planting. But they didn't know what, you know, they thought, okay, it's gonna get cold, so they're also put, you know, creating these hoop houses. So there's my students building these. And you have to understand that they're, you know, a lot, the, the thing that's, the, one of the coolest things about this is my students that are coming from other countries, they come from agricultural backgrounds. They come here and they think, well, you know, they had ag classes in their country, but they did not know that we had this here. So they get really excited. And I have learned so much from my students because they grew up farming. And, you know, their practices are much more, you know, in keeping with like, you know, organic farming than it is using chemicals. So they're, they're, they're pretty interesting students to work with. And a lot of those children are also the kids who rely on 
free and reduced meals. And I just want to put a pl make a plug really quickly that um, one of my students was sharing with me that he can't get food during, during the summer months. And he said, I, I lose 10 pounds every month, every summer, because I don't, he said, you know, I don't have all, all the food that I am able to eat during the school year. So you can see how important it is. But now they also bring home food that they grow. So here's some more. We're, this is our next, our next project that kids want to do is this Hugel culture, which is sort of this really old style raised bed. Two minutes? Okay. So here's aeroponics. We do a lot of hydroponics. And I just want to show you this. Um, this was created by one of my students who wants to, to make a aquaponic system using fish to fertilize the, the plants. Well, this is a kid who was flunking out of school. He was failing everything. I mean everything. And they didn't know how he was going to graduate. They were kind of pulling their hair out. And then he, he, he knew me because I taught him in ninth grade. And he came to my class and fell in love with the curriculum. So now I have him four periods a day. And um, this system is so complex. It goes from one box, the water goes into another box to clean it, goes into another box, and then ends up in, in a, you know, in, and, and he balanced this, and he worked it out, and it, I mean, there's no way I could create this. And yet it gave him, he's, he's a really, really smart kid who was failing school. Um, and so now he's, you know, he's very successful and much happier. This is another couple of systems that the kids created, and these all work. Um, the, the one on, on the left is growing lettuce, and it's a two-tier system using a fish pump and, um, you know, the other one is a, t is a tower that's also growing lettuce. We have window farms. And this is one of my students who's, gro he, he set up a system to grow peas in the greenhouse. And it's a pretty elaborate, um, using just string and, and some bamboo. So, you know, I want, I think you've heard all this. You know, it's kind of the so what, kids are growing plants. But they, it's so amazing. I have special needs kids. I've had, I had an autistic um, child who would come in every day and all he wanted to do was grow tomatoes. He had about 20 tomato plants and he would spend hours just taking care of his plants. And it, and it was so like taking that stress down. Um, kids are really creative and, and you know, have such ingenuity if we let them do this. And one teacher, it's, this is in four high schools in the county, one of the teachers said to me, you know, thank you so much, Jill, for giving me the courage to just turn it over to the kids because I'm such a control freak. I was, she said she was really afraid to let the kids do it, and she said it is so amazing what they can, what they can accomplish, you know, when given those tools. And they're all engineers. So kids really love plants. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. And we look forward to that new curriculum being spread to schools throughout the county. Um, I also just wanted to say one other thing which occurred to me while we were listening to when we were talking about the salad parties. Uh, there has been the misunderstanding in Montgomery County among many school administrators and teachers that you can't eat anything that's grown on school property inside the school. Um, and I am happy to report after confirming with Marla earlier this year that that is not true. That in fact you are more than welcome to bring food grown on school property, to eat it inside the school, including in the school cafeteria. So once again, the best hands down way, if you want to get kids to start eating some vegetables, get them to start growing some and try them. Um, our final speaker for the panel today 
I'm thrilled to have thrilled to have them all here. Um, Kathy Lawrence is a longtime leader in food justice. Um, she was the one of the co-founders and the original executive director of the uh, campaign, the National Campaign for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, she is now the director of strategic development for School Food Focus, uh, an organization that works with large, usually but not exclusively, I guess, urban school districts uh, to make their school meals more healthful, more regionally sourced and more sustainably produced. Again, all the things that we are looking forward to doing here in Montgomery County. So please welcome Kathy Lawrence from School Food Focus. Well, it is really fun and inspiring to be here, and it's really good to follow the hands-on, hands-in-the-soil uh, inspiration with probably a 10 or 30 or 40 or 100,000 foot view of what's going on out there. Uh, as Gordon mentioned, I've been working in sustainable agriculture and food justice for almost 25 years now, and I want to share three of my core beliefs. One is that it's all connected. Absolutely everything is connected from the subatomic level to the intergalactic level and sort of everything in between. And I think that we've talked uh, around or about some of the economic, environmental, and social justice issues that we're all working on. And those two, in my mind, are completely and totally interconnected, as are, I think, all of the folks in this room. So it's really exciting to be here. My, my second belief is that we have absolutely got the power that we need to change some of the very large systems that we're talking about. And so getting kids involved at the very local level is absolutely essential to education and passion. And we also have to recognize that there are huge systems that are in place that make this kind of work really difficult and infinitely more difficult than it ought to be and yet we have the power in this room and in the country to make the changes we just have to use it really well for collective impact and my third belief is that the Beatles completely had it right and at some very fundamental level love is really all you need Gordon wanted me to start a little bit with why we are looking at fresh real local food in schools. I think it's pretty obvious from the morning's conversation. Um, and we all know this. So we've talked about obesity. We've talked about hunger. We've, you've all seen this statistic that, um, you know, this generation of children could well be the first that don't live as long as their parents precisely because of the food that they're eating. Uh, and so I think what we're looking at at School Food Focus really is the the dual problems of obesity and hunger as well as the legacy of 40 or 50 years of both public policy and marketplace innovation that's really been focused on cheap food, maximum production, short-term return, et cetera, and really not looking at, say, maximum nutrition per acre. Uh, and so what we're looking at is 32 million kids who are eating school lunch, 13 million or more who are now eating school breakfast, nearly 20 million of those as we've talked about are, are getting free and reduced meals. We're talking about $14 billion spent on food in just the K-12 public school system. So there's power there to create the change that we're looking at. So there's huge potential as well as huge problems that we're facing. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about school food focus and then give some really concrete examples of what school districts across the country are doing. Um, we're a national collaborative. We work with 36 of the largest school districts in the country. Oh, and I wanted to commend you for doing the translation and to apologize in advance for how quickly I'm speaking. <laughs> So we work with the school food service directors in these large districts are our core stakeholders. Those directors and the community partners that they choose to work with uh, and are at the forefront of school food procurement change and really looking to leverage that change to get the more healthful, regional, and sustainable foods uh, that Gordon talked about. And so essentially we're looking at the power of the public plate to shift not only what's on cafeteria trays but also the food systems that supply that food. So our overarching goal really is to transform entire food systems so that they help to uh, feed kids, help their academic achievement, 
increase their lifelong health and directly benefit farmers, workers throughout the supply chain, uh, regional economies, and the environment. So big, huge, you know, goals. I think what I'm hearing in this room and certainly what we look at at School Food Focus is sort of a combination of urgency and vision and pragmatism. And the urgency is that in districts here, in districts across the country, the districts that we work with, kids need better food now. They need it yesterday, they need it today, they need it tomorrow. The districts that we're working with are, for the most part, not just urban districts, but also pretty high poverty districts. So most of them are 60 or 70 percent free and reduced. Many of them are 85, 89, 90, 92 percent free and reduced. And for some of those most vulnerable children in our society, they're getting up to two-thirds of their nutrition from school food. And so it's essential that those are healthy calories, healthy nutrition. Um, the vision is that we're not only changing what's on the plate, sort of food item by food item, as it makes most sense, we're also looking at what are the long-term changes that need to be made in order to make more healthful, regional, sustainable food the default, the easiest food to get, as opposed to the toughest food to get. And the pragmatism is sort of balancing that short-term need and the long-term vision with what steps can be taken day to day, month to month, year to year. Um, so we do a lot of things in terms of uh, supply chain discovery, really looking at who are the producers, who are the aggregators, processors, and distributors of food. Because in addition to really local fruits and vegetables, we're looking across the whole plate also at grains, dairy, and protein. And for districts the size of Montgomery County, a lot of the food is going to continue to be regionally and nationally sourced. That's simply the way it has to work in the current food system at the scale that we're working with. And so looking at the aggregation, processing, and distribution to make things more and more regional is essential. Looking at peer learning so that folks like Tony uh, and like Marla who are making changes sharing with one another, not having to recreate the wheel, not having to create the same mistakes, um, and, and learning. And policy, I'm not going to be able to talk about it all, but you guys are in the shadow, <laughs> as you know, of our federal government and are so well positioned to be bringing both the issues, the problems that you've identified, as well as the successes and the real live stories straight into Washington, D.C., where it needs to be heard. Okay, I'm going to keep going here. Some of the specific ways that we've worked with districts is um, helping them define what their procurement change goals are. What foods do they particularly want to change and have had difficulty changing on their own and then bringing a research and technical assistance team to them to help make those changes. So St. Paul was one of our first school food learning labs and some of the outcomes there were helping them increase dramatically their local uh, fresh fruit and vegetable uh, procurement, making a transition for a from 100% white to 53% whole grain buns. These are a few years ago. Uh, they really wanted to work on their chicken, and chicken's tough. It's one of the most vertically integrated uh, and most concentrated supply chains in the country. You guys are in Delmarva. You know this. I don't need to tell you. Um, but we helped them to find locally sourced chicken. Um, they were, as many districts are, reluctant at first to be handling raw chicken. There are real concerns about food safety, and Tony's going to speak much more about his personal experience in Memphis with this. But they realized that to, in order to be able to control all of the ingredients that they wanted to and move away from the highly processed, full of additives, full of fillers, full of sodium, and trans fat chicken nuggets and chicken patties, what they really needed to do was move to a whole piece of chicken. And to get it at the price that they could afford to procure, they had to get it raw and cook it. Okay. Um, also worked on sugar reduction in their flavored milk. Not something I was a big fan of, I gotta say. But 
it was a priority for them. We managed to help them get their supplier to turn around by doing a poll of all of the school districts in the entire state of Minnesota, saying, yes, we all want this, and we'll get someone else to do it if you won't. So now all of the districts in Minnesota and in neighboring Wisconsin and Illinois have access to uh, reduced sugar flavored milks. So we went from St. Paul to Denver. Hello? There we go. No. <laughs> uh, and did similar kinds of work. Um, St. Paul is a little under 40,000. Denver's about 70,000 kids. Um, so we helped them increase their local produce. Uh, really did a lot of work on grass-fed local beef and trying to get the ground beef that was the really only affordable cut that the district could afford um, made into their own recipes at a cook chill operation in Denver and um, then got districts just district-wide installation of salad bars and helped them with their school garden program. They also worked with the Department of Health to put in place the Department of Health uh, approved protocols for taking the food from the gardens into the cafeteria. So um, they actually have that up on their website at Denver Public Schools if you're interested in looking at that. A um, lot of staff training on scratch cooking and of course they were purchasing that student grown produce. We moved to Chicago. How am I doing? I think you're great. <laughs> Gordon thinks I'm wonderful. I must be. Um, so we went next to Chicago Public Schools. So orders of magnitude bigger, 410,000 kids. Uh, can't remember what the free and reduced rate is, but it's right around 90%. Uh, and they really wanted to work on antibiotic-free chicken. And they wanted it through the USDA Foods Commodity Program. It's like, yes, this is not an 18-month project. Um, getting the AB food through the commodities. So we worked with them to figure out what success would look, look like in terms of chicken and were able to help them get onto the USDA Foods national list a new item. So they bought about 600,000 pounds of chicken leg quarters through USDA Foods and that item became available to districts across the country and also helped them to source uh, through some help from uh, and connections really from Whole Foods, connected them with local Amish farmers who were growing uh, chickens raised without antibiotics uh, and were interested in selling the drumsticks to Chicago public schools instead of selling it to Mexico where it had been going before because Whole Foods was taking everything else. Uh, and so they managed in that same school year to get about 600,000 pounds of local uh, raised without antibiotics chicken. And they taught their cooks in 457 schools to handle that chicken and then distributed to the others so that it was 473 schools serving fresh baked chicken two to three times a month in the 11-12 school year and that has continued. Yay! I'm gonna keep going. Uh, so we have moved from our um, single district learning lab model to a regional approach because our districts in the network were saying, well, it's all fine and good for you to be working with one district at a time, but what about us? There are big systems we need to move as well. And so we've got two projects going on now. One is with seven districts in the upper Midwest, uh, and that's looking at turkey, well, I'll get there, turkey, chicken, produce and uh, legumes. Uh, and the other is continuing the national work on chicken through our national procurement initiative. Um, first, I just want to give a couple more examples of what's going on because Gordon asked me to specifically focus on that. So school food procurement change and menu change can be big and it can be small and things that are look small from the outside can actually be very big. So one of the wonderful school food service directors that we work with in Portland, Oregon, is doing amazing local produce, she's doing amazing local chicken, she's doing all kinds of stuff with legumes and local chilies. I asked her what she was proudest of in the last couple of years and she said, completely eliminating ranch dressing from my menu and replacing it, seriously, and replacing it with a local Marionberry dressing, and now they've added a couple of others, but getting that ranch dressing off of the menu because kids aren't just dipping their vegetables in it, they're dipping their pizza in it, and I was like, what? Anyway, so I just, that's sort of the, the pragmatism and the incremental change part. It's real. 
It's real change and needs to be recognized and celebrated as such. Okay, so very quickly, we're working with these seven districts in the upper Midwest. They're serving about 700,000 kids. They've got about $407 million in purchasing power. So big food manufacturers, big supply chains, distributors, whatnot, begin to pay attention when you can garner that kind of procurement power and ask for stuff that's not currently in the supply chain, again, at the scale that these districts are, are serving. We're very grateful to our funders. Um, so, I, I said very briefly the kinds of things that we're working on. One is looking at the complete produce supply chain in the Midwest, how those districts are getting their produce outside of the direct farm to school projects that each of them do have going. There's still the bulk of the fruits and vegetables that they're serving that has to come from somewhere and they'd like it to be coming from somewhere more regional as opposed to California. And so really looking at who's out there and available to do uh, fresh and fresh frozen uh, firsts, meaning the, the grade A quality stuff, as well as cosmetically imperfect but perfectly nutritious seconds to see how we can get more fresh fruits and vegetables flowing into those school districts from within their region because as Marla said, one of the toughest things for districts to do in implementing the new meal standards is the cost increase associated with fruits and vegetables. So figuring out regionally how to get the better produce, get a better price to the farmers, and get the higher volume at a price point the districts can afford is something that we're really focused on. Um, so I'm going to breeze through all of this. I mentioned the turkey, the grains and beans, the fruits and vegetables, and the chicken. I'll go very quickly to our National Procurement Initiative, which is 15 districts across the country really looking at this issue of chicken. And collectively, those 15 districts are purchasing about $28 million worth of chicken a year. So again, that's a drop in the bucket for the Tysons and the Pilgrim's Prides of the world, but it's significant enough to make them sit up and pay attention. Um, again, we're grateful to our funders. Uh, these are the school districts we're working with. You can find this all on our website if you'd like to um, look <laughs> in more depth. Um, what we're really looking at, I breezed through that, is chicken that's more helpful on the plate <clears throat> and or more helpful in the environment. So more helpful on the plate means moving away from that highly processed chicken that has all of the additives that our uh, previous speakers were talking about to whole muscle chicken and everything that that means in terms of supply, in terms of cooking facilities, in terms of professional development, menu development, student acceptability, all of those kinds of things. So moving away from those chopped and formed, increasing the fresh and frozen chicken, really getting to the bottom of antibiotic use. Are you all familiar with the problem of antibiotic resistance in this country? Are you all familiar with the fact that 80% of the antibiotics used in this country are for animal agriculture? Are you aware that in the United States we're still, still feeding the exact same antibiotics that are used and absolutely vital in human medicine? That's what we're using in the animal agriculture? Yeah, so, okay, you got all that. We're gonna change it. <clears throat> Woo! <laughs> um, and we'd love to work in Delmarva. So, um, and we're also looking then to spur regional supply because again, chicken production is extraordinarily concentrated in a few regions uh, and almost completely absent elsewhere. Okay, so my call to action is to really um, think about a vision. I mean, I really just wanna give you some food for thought as we go into lunch and then hear from Tony and you all go into your work. Um, I would love for us to all share a vision of school food that is actually at the forefront of social and environmental and economic change, where school food is what is ensuring that all children in America have healthful food, have access to that food, and understand what that means. Um, I think that for me, enlightened institutional procurement, whether that's K-12 school districts or hospitals or childcare and adult feeding uh, operations or government offices, we're spending billions of dollars. And I think enlightened procurement policies by those kinds of institutions really can transform the food system 
towards economic, environmental health, uh, economic, environmental, and social health, as well as justice. Um, so, I just want to thank you again for being here and uh, keep singing the Beatles. <laughs> what kind of uh, resistance did you find? Um, did you find any? So I know the summer care was one issue, but what objections did you face and how did you address them? Um, I didn't so much receive resistance, but some skepticism from our school principal that we were allowed to grow food, um, which, you know, just entailed a very direct conversation with him and then, you know, had to go back and get my sources together. And, um, but, you know, once he realized that it was allowed, he was, he thought the pro he thinks the program is wonderful. I think it's just a matter of the school system being a bureaucracy and, you know, everyone wants to make sure they're following the rules. So, yeah. Great. Uh, one follow-up. Did you have to take into consideration allergies with the uh, items you planted? Um, well, we're mostly planting vegetables, and I guess I, I hadn't thought too much about allergies except for with the strawberries. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we just need to talk to the teacher in the classroom ahead of time and just say, you know, what allergies do you have in your classroom? Um, Perfect. I've heard certain objections like that, so I was curious. Thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> A uh, funny remark when we ran the campaign to get um, the new policy on school vegetable gardens, the previous superintendent, Dr. Wiest, um, listed his objections on a document. It was probably his single biggest mistake putting it in writing. Um, but one of them was food allergies. And the Master Gardeners um, accessed the list of the 10 most common food allergies for children. And guess what? They were all things that were being served in the school cafeteria. Nothing that grew in a garden. So it really is, when you look at it, a non-issue. Hi, um, Gordon, Lindsay, and the other organizers. Wow, thank you for a really amazing um, day and some all-star panels. My, um, I have two questions for Kathy. Um, my first is, are you getting any interest from school districts in the greater Washington region to join in what you're doing in the national procurement? Um, my second question is, how, and maybe this is a lunchtime conversation, but how do you think about this issue of cost? Um, DC is doing something really interesting with a beverage tax that they're using to provide additional reimbursement for school meals. I know that Portland's doing something along those lines too. Could you just sort of speak to the promise and potential of that or um, really any thoughts that you have on that would be welcome. Thank you. Thank you, those are good questions. Um, we, I think there is a lot of interest in the chicken work and one of the things that will be happening is we're developing specifications right now for three specific products and uh, working again with, with commercial growers at various scales in various regions as well as with USDA foods and looking across the school uh, cooking preparation spectrum. So for folks who can do scratch cooking, great, and those who can only do or can mostly do heat and serve will have products available for them. Once we get those specifications hammered out and hashed out with suppliers, those specs will be available on our website for any districts anywhere to use, and the, we're hopeful of getting three new products on the USDA foods list for the 14-15 school year. Two will be on the list, I hope, for January 2014, so for the whole school year, and one we're looking for in June of 2014, so second half of 2014-15 school year ordering. Uh, and, fingers crossed, we uh, just got a bit of funding to do more work in the southern region, and so we will be specifically looking for districts and, uh, to partner with in terms of expanding the chicken work in the area where chicken production is most prevalent. Um, so we're excited about that and that will be coming within the next six or seven months. Um, in terms of the, are, I, I think your question had to do with the increased cost of some of these better foods, whether they're more healthful, regional, and sustainable, and how to get the, the funds to uh, cover the costs for that. Um, 
what we have found is that A, it's not always the case by any means that local or regional costs more. It depends on seasonality, it depends on the product, it depends on, um, again, if you're able to get the chicken drums or you're able to get uh, minimally processed uh, foods, it can, or you get apples in season or peaches in season or whatever that is, they can often be the same or less. Some things simply cost more. Uh, raised without antibiotic chicken tends to cost more and so most of our school food service directors in the 36 districts that we've been working with have been figuring out how to juggle their budgets uh, and uh, make that work internally without outside sources of funding. Uh, it's pretty remarkable to see these folks who both have the nutrition uh, and dietetic background and really by definition have to have pretty darn good business management skills because they are running big operations. Uh, and so that's what we have found has worked best is when there's some combination of those two skills and figuring out how to balance the budget. Part of our peer learning network has also been about just sharing very basic operational tips to um, to save funds so that the districts can spend that money on food. Just take these last two questions and then we'll go to lunch. My name is Sophia Marvell and I'm the education director at Brickyard Educational Farm and our mission is to connect students with where their food comes from and to connect them with farms and also to help school institutions be connected with farms and farmers. So this is a question for Kathy, but I would hope that this conversation might lead to a follow-up where we include the players of the farmers and the food aggregators and food distributors to really see where we can go from here. So I was wondering if, Kathy, you had any advice for us of how you make the original, like initial connections with farmers and try to get buy-in so that it's economically feasible for all parties. It, it is a very good question, and it, it, it takes a, a variety of forms. Uh, sometimes, we often work with what the districts are already buying and looking at where they're getting it from various sources, and often they have one or two folks who really are very local, and so we, we work with them first. We tend to also work through community partners on the ground, because we're a national organization, we can't be everywhere, and the whole point is to help ensure that the relationships that need to be built between the producers, aggregators, processors, and distributors, and the school districts are built in place and remain in place and continue to grow over time, uh, regardless of what School Food Focus might be doing in terms of a short-term project. Uh, and so we'll work with groups. Um, we work with local extension folks. We work with uh, local advocacy organizations. Sometimes we will subcontract out in California, for example, we're working with the Community Alliance for Family Farmers because they're infinitely better situated than we are to really sit down and do the very detailed supply chain uh, analysis, talk with the individual farmers, bring them into conversation uh, about what it is that the school districts need, what they're looking for, both in terms of the characteristics of the food and the price point and the volume and the delivery, all of those kinds of things. So we try to do it with folks in place so it doesn't tend to be school food focused core staff, but that those are the, it, we bring the, the producers into the conversation once the districts, uh, uh, with the multi-district projects, they have to agree on the specific food items they want to work on. So we start with a food category like produce and then we go to a specific item where we start with chicken and we go to, okay, we want drums, whatever it is. Then bring the producers and the processors in to see what can be done with a real focus on the immediate short-term needs for volume and the medium and longer term desire to really support more local and regional food system development. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hi, this is more for the uh, women with the Sherwood High School and the elementary. Uh, in Montgomery County, it seems to me one of the challenges is to have school-based gardens that, you know, and then, some, then there's summer vacation. But has there been any thought about going forward and developing a summer camp program where the kids really are about, that the camp is about not only learning that, but they're therefore 
maintaining the garden. And I and I would think that your some of your Sherwood High School students would be great camp camp leaders in that in that regard. So it has any anything been thought along those lines? I think that's a great idea. I think there would be lots of high school students that would enjoy something like that, and also, you know, younger students. Um, I have no clue how you would go about doing that, <laughs> uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, my students will be working with um, students at Sherwood Elementary because they have a courtyard there that um, with raised beds, and we're going to start working with the kids. I think, you know, we, we work through the summer also. I shut down the greenhouse, but we have, you know, beds in the outside that we continue to have to take care of. I, I'd never thought of that. I, um, just along those lines, I know that our school this summer had a summer camp program already established at the school, and perhaps as a starting point, you know, the garden could become a part of that regular program as one of the activities that the children do, mm -hmm. and you know, just to get that integrated in, possibly, for schools to stay open. Thank you. Let's have another round of applause for our panel, please. And. Uh